Well, good morning to all of you. Good morning. It is a joy and delight to see you all here. It is truly a gift for us to be able to gather in worship, whether you're joining us online or you are here in our sanctuary space. We want you to know that no matter who you are and no matter where you happen to be on life's journey, you are very welcome here. Indeed, we trust that God's spirit is at work among us, that God is going to be able to provide the inspiration each of us needs, and that together we can discover how we can live out our faith in the wider world the rest of the week. So with all of that in mind, we always like to affirm something when we gather, and that is God's goodness. Sometimes, this is especially important given what's going on in the wider world. Uh, and so when we do that, I say, um, God is good and all of you are invited to respond all the time. And then I say all the time and all of you are invited to say, God is good. So let's do that. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. And because you can't say it too much, let's do it again. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Amen and amen. Thank you all so very much. And our deacon Marilyn is now going to lead us in the responsive call to worship. Will you join me in the call to worship? Come, let us praise the one who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them. Praise God who keeps faith forever. Come and worship the one who executes justice for the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. Praise God who lifts up those who are bowed down. Come and rejoice, for there is good news to be shared. Praise God who watches over us and upholds the last and the least. Come and take hold of a life that really is life. Let us worship God. Our opening hymn, you'll find it's number six in the black hymnal, or you can uh, follow along with the words that will be on the screen. Sing praise to God, our highest good. We're just going to sing verses one, two, four, and five.
seated. Please join me in the prayer of confession. O oh God, in Christ you have shown us the way to experience true well-being and joyful aliveness, but we often find ourselves pursuing things that suck the life out of us. We may look for security in money or possessions, we may worry more about things we can't control than we trust in your care for us. We may feel lonely, exhausted, bitter, or just plain stuck. We may avoid asking for help. We may be blind to what is hurting us or the people around us. Sometimes we even step around the ones who would bless or challenge us. Forgive, Forgive us, us, O God. God. Deliver, Deliver us from, from all that entraps us. us. Show, Show us how to live a life of faith, faith hope, love, gentleness, and joy. Beloved people of God, hear this wonderful good news. We can trust this. God's loving presence is always with us. God never abandons us, even when we wander far from the life God longs for us to experience. When we call, God answers with forgiveness and mercy, hope and healing. God delivers us from all that ensnares us and shows us how to be fully, abundantly, joyfully alive. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, our scripture texts this morning are both continuing. Oh, I'm double microphoning myself. Sorry. Try that again. Are both uh, continuing the theme that we've been on uh, in our uh, scripture passages for several weeks now, that of what to do about money. And our first lesson is from uh, 1 Timothy. I'm going to invite uh, those who will be reading in the um, second reading to come forward and just kind of uh, sit in the front pew uh, while we uh, take care of the first reading. So the first reading is from 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6 verses, um, I think it's 6 through 12 and 17 through 19. Hold on, let me just double check. Um, and uh, our readers this morning are going to be your very own Deacon Marilyn and myself. Of course, there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment, for we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin, 
and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. But as for you, man of God, shun all of this. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and for which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. As for those who in the present age are rich, commend them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share. Thus, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of the life that really is life. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Now our second lesson, oh, and I should just say that um, the epistle, the letter of First Timothy is written to someone who is a younger person, who is uh, learning to be essentially a pastor and preacher. And so that's why we heard the phrase, as for you, man of God, because it's addressed to a particular person named Timothy. Not that that doesn't apply to all of us, whether we're men or not. All right, well now, on to our second lesson uh, from the Gospel according to Luke. It's a parable that Jesus tells in response to the Pharisees who are kind of cranky with him because at least the way Luke puts it, they love money. I would say that they have a particular interpretation of the scriptures that makes them say, why are you so adamant about people sharing everything and uh, not having very much uh, Jesus and keeping things in common? But we'll get to that in the sermon. In any case, we're going to be reading from Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. Cindy N. Uh, is going to be standing at the lectern, and she will be reading the part of the rich man in the parable. Sue C. will be joining us on Zoom, and she will uh, be the part of Lazarus, the poor man in the parable, and Jean B. will be Abraham in the parable. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, Remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus, in like manner, evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, 
so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Our hymn of preparation is Open My Eyes. You'll find it on the insert and or you can also find it uh, on the screen. Well, as some of you may know, this week uh, I attended a virtual conference of the national setting of the United Church of Christ, and uh, it was really quite intriguing, and it was trying to address how we're going to be church together uh, following the pandemic and still in the pandemic and some of the different things that have happened in congregations even before the pandemic, some of the trends uh, and how to address those and how, how to think of ourselves in new ways. I don't know if you're familiar with this about me, but I kind of enjoy sometimes when things are really going south, it seems like in the wider world, whether it's the political situation in our country and the deep divisions, or it's you know uh, terrible aggressors like Putin, uh, thinking that they can just invade whoever and, and, and wreak horrors upon other people, or any number of other things, um, people suffering from homelessness or poverty or uh, drug addiction, what have you. Whenever these things kind of overwhelm me, I kind of like to read 
apocalyptic kind of novels, you know, where everything has gone completely sideways. Life as we know it is totally upended and the people, the characters in the story have to kind of figure things out. And I think I like that because it's like we finally ripped off the Band-Aid and things are as south as they could possibly be. So pretty much at this point, anything could only be looking up. Well, what I appreciated about attending this uh, summit is that there was lots of creative thinking going on in lots of different contexts in the United Church of Christ. And there was also a reminder of what it is that we need to return to. And in a way, it was like a lens helping us to, to focus in the midst of all of the different things um, that challenge our attention, that maybe pull us off track, to pay attention to where God is at work. One of the speakers, in fact, the last sort of keynote speaker at the end, um, she talked about, and it was a really powerful talk, and if I can figure out a way to get some of that video and embed it into a PowerPoint, I might be able to share that some Sunday. But in any case, here is a pastor and teacher in the United Church of Christ who is also someone who is a fiber artist and someone who's committed to repairing rather than just throwing away articles of clothing. And she was talking about the unraveling that all of us have experienced, that the pandemic just kind of put a even stronger uh, emphasis on, the unraveling that we're experiencing, not just in our congregations, but in the wider society, the, the sense of how we are even more distant from each other and so on. And, and she talked about the God that we worship. In Exodus 15, chapter 15 is referred to as Yahweh, or often translated into Jehovah, Jehovah Rapha, which translated means, I am the God who repairs, who remakes. And of course, we know in the book of Revelations that we hear affirmed, God is able to make all things new. And shoot, as people of the resurrection, we know that God can absolutely transform what seems like an absolute dead end, a, a horrible and final shut door into a new opening for all kinds of life, new life to blossom. But of course, the challenge is that when Jesus rose, he was unrecognizable to many of the people who thought they knew him well. So resurrection isn't just resuscitation of what we've known. It's something different. And death has to happen first. Which brings me to one of the people who uh, spoke during one of the worship sessions. And that is a true elder in the United Church of Christ, an amazing uh, black woman, pastor, preacher, theologian, Reverend Dr. Yvonne Delk. And she shared this. She had heard a story about an earthquake in another country. And after the earthquake passed, people came out to look at the damage and everything had crumbled. The buildings had crumbled. The only thing that was Everything had crumbled, even the church had crumbled. And the only thing that was left standing was an altar. And she says, the priest who was telling the story that she heard simply said this, sometimes it appears God turns everything upside down to reveal that which cannot be shaken that which has a core, that which can be an anchor. We are in this kind of in-between space where we are seeking and in need of an anchor, something that we can hold on to and return to when it feels like other things might be falling apart around us. Reverend Delt goes on to say, 
When I find myself in that place where everything is shifting around me, it causes me then to have to dig deep inside myself to find that which is the core to my existence. Faith can enable you to endure almost anything and allow you to keep coming back, keep coming back. It puts that spirit inside you to rise from whatever it is that is holding your mind, body, and spirit in captivity, whatever it is that's trying to get you off course. This can enable you to bounce back from whatever life throws you. You've got an anchor that can steady you. So when I'm moving through whatever is making me feel out of control, I've got to get back to what is basic to me and remind myself, ultimately, what is at the core of my being and my existence. The thing that can really mess up our sense of that faith and kind of twist things around for us sometimes, as Jesus wisely points out, is money. You see, money can, and having it, can make us feel as though we are protected in some fashion from others and from situations that might otherwise uh, cause us to feel like the ground is shaking between us. But our faith is not meant to insulate us from the changes and challenges of life. After all, Jesus was pretty clear that following him entailed risk, loss, and letting go of some of the stuff we cling to because it won't keep us safe anyway. Our faith can't protect us from the vulnerabilities of being human, but it does give us resilience when we get knocked down because we can keep returning to that core, just like Reverend Dr. Delk told us about. The problem is that wealth can provide a false sense of security and a kind of insidious isolation. It fosters arrogance, the sense that one is going to be protected or that one doesn't need others. And one of the other keynote speakers, Reverend Tracy Blackman, who is our national officer and um, leader for justice and local church ministries in the United Church of Christ. She talked about how churches need to move from an organization mentality to an organism way of looking at themselves. And by organism, she means understanding how we are all in relationship, integral relationship of reliance upon one another, not just in our congregations, but in the wider world. The thing is, the Pharisees that Jesus is addressing in this parable today, the Pharisees were scholars, biblical scholars, and they were also people that were trying to help Jews who were not going to be able to attend the temple in Jerusalem on a regular basis for worship, trying to help them find out ways they can live their faith in everyday life. But Jesus sees something in them that we might see in certain realms of Christianity today. And that is, he sees them in some fashion preaching a prosperity gospel. And they've got reasons to think about this because, let's be clear, the scriptures do in some places imply that God rewards the faithful and the righteous and God punishes the wicked and that that reward might look like having plenty of food, having a lovely house, having enough money, and that when you're poor, or you have a disease, that that's your own fault and that is somehow manifesting God's judgment of you. Sadly, you can find that in scripture. That's what's so upsetting. And yet, 
And yet, as Fred Craddock wisely pointed out, Scripture can be found that support the position that the righteous prosper and the wicked suffer, but Jesus, who blessed the poor and urged a free sharing of one's goods with those in need, regarded the Pharisees' interpretation of the Scriptures as a gross misinterpretation, failing to understand what God is really about. And let's just be clear, whoever is in power always wants to find a justification for why they are in power, why they have resources, right? And what better thing to be able to point to than saying God wanted it to be that way. So we have this story that Jesus tells of a rich man who every day dresses in very fine clothes, even wears purple, which indicates that he may have a position of authority in his wider community and definitely demonstrates he has plenty of wealth because we know that purple dye was pretty expensive to come by in the ancient world. And he feasts on an elaborate multiple meals every single day, but at his gate, oh yes, he lives in a gated community, at his gate, there is one who is so impoverished that he has no health care, what to speak of, and is so hungry, it's as if his very body is manifesting his malnourishment through all these sores that erupt. And that man, Lazarus, would do anything in order to just even be able to have the crumbs that fall from the rich man's table. Now, some commentators say, oh, guess what? The rich guy just didn't see him. You know, he's insulated by his wealth. He just didn't see Lazarus at his gate. I say, I highly doubt that. Wealthy people, and even those of us who are ordinarily uh, with resources, we do notice people who are homeless. We do see people who are suffering. It's just we don't want to have to change our course of action when we encounter that kind of person who is struggling, in part because it reminds us of our own vulnerability, in part because we're afraid of what will be asked of us, in part because, quite frankly, we might not be so comfortable that we have and someone else doesn't. What's amazing about this story and what Jesus manages to capture so brilliantly is the arrogance of wealth. Because in the parable, the rich guy is suffering torment. And let's just be clear, Jesus is using a, a sort of... A, contemporary understanding of what happens. Jesus is not about people going to hell. Um, and while they use the, the Greek word Hades, it's just kind of a, a, a way of describing, uh, making a context for the story. So don't take this to mean that wealthy people are all automatically going to hell. That's not what Jesus is about. Instead though, what happens is that this rich guy discovers that the person outside his gate is now in a place of great peace and love and security while he's super thirsty. So what does he do? He orders, like a rich guy might, he orders the Abraham to do something and get Lazarus to come and do something for him. It's like even in his extremity. He's still thinking that he has the ability to tell other people what to do and to, and to make the poor jump to his own tune. It's a, quite an extraordinary indictment of wealth and what it can do to people and the way they, they see themselves and others. What Jesus is really trying to get about is that our money should never be something that isolates us from others' needs. It should never be something we use to protect ourselves, and it should never be something that is the source of our security. Our relationships with other people, that's where we find true vitality. And Jesus calls us to resist 
the idea that wealth and prosperity is somehow deserved by those who enjoy them. No, instead, he is much more concerned about turning things upside down, about helping people to see that there is another way to experience true aliveness. And it's through sharing. It's through being able to have compassion and empathy for others. The aliveness that Jesus wants us to know is something that gives us the capacity again and again to cope with what otherwise much might crush us. It's what helps us to dance even in the midst of the storm. It's what helps us to return again and again to what is truly valuable. God's love for us and our love for God, which is in fact demonstrated in how we love our neighbors. Jesus, and in fact, the author of First Timothy, invites us to recognize the power of generosity, the power of sharing, and the power of noticing. Noticing that which we might otherwise try to ignore, step around, or somehow avoid. Vulnerability, that is what Jesus calls us to, being open to the struggle of others and being willing to share our own struggle. This is how we resist the wider world's emphasis on consumerism, on accumulating wealth and stuff as a way to insulate ourselves, as a way to find security, which in and of itself is ephemeral and can't last. Whether it's because the stock market has just decided things are pretty bleak, whether it's because life turns out something like a, a, an illness or an accident, a loss, wealth can't keep us safe, but it can be the means through which we repair the world, through which we join Jehovah Rapha, the God who repairs and mends what is broken in doing something extraordinary, ensuring our neighbors, especially those who otherwise are left behind by society, know that they are cherished and deeply valued. We do this with our Sharing Saturday ministry. We do this whenever we happen to be at a stoplight and we see somebody holding up a sign explaining how they are hungry and that anything would help. And at the very least, looking that person in the eye, smiling and nodding, instead of just trying very hard to lock our doors, put up our windows and stare straight ahead because we don't want to see someone else's vulnerability. I happen to know that uh, Denise and Jean, our two coordinators for our sharing Saturday ministry, often bring with them in the car and just have on hand some blessing bags, they call them. Things that might have like a granola bar or, um, you know, a, 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 one of those cheese and crackers or peanut butter and cracker packages things. Uh, they also have maybe some toiletries maybe even a pair of underwear. And they give this to the person that they see and they say, God bless you. Maybe, just maybe, this world wouldn't be such a frightening, scary, and upsetting place if we returned again and again to the core to the love of God, that it might grow 
and blossom within us so we can resist the wider world's insistence on creating an us and them, on making separations, building walls, and pointing the finger of judgment and blame. Maybe that's with the church in the next 50, 100 years, if we really focused on that, that's how we could experience true aliveliness. That's how we could have vitality. That's how we could dance in the midst of the storm. We are called to that kind of lively resistance, beloved people of God, and we have all the tools. Trust God who is with us. Amen. In our prayers this morning, uh, we will have an opportunity both for those here in the sanctuary and those who are joining us on Zoom uh, to share your prayers, to speak them aloud. Uh, just so you know, for those in the sanctuary, I will repeat your prayer because you are not mic'd and that way people online can hear you. Let us be together now in a spirit of prayer. Holy and loving God, when we go off course, when we wonder how are we to respond to the challenges of this day, when we feel as though we have been tossed and shaken and thrown about by circumstances beyond our control, Help us to ground ourselves, to root ourselves in your love and to discover the power of relationship, of vulnerability, of generosity, compassion, and empathy. Show us what is possible, God, when we free ourselves from the sense of scarcity that is so prevalent in the wider world. When we discover that we are enough and we have enough to make a profound difference each and every day in our hurting, mixed up world. God in your mercy. Holy One, there are many situations that are unraveling, many, many circumstances that need to be repaired. Inspire us throughout this week, God, to find opportunities and to respond to openings for action where we can actually act in loving ways and where we can practice kindness. God, in your mercy. We pray for those among us, God, who are struggling because they cannot find enough to eat at a price that they could afford. For those who long for safe, affordable housing. Those who feel like their lives don't matter that no one cares, who feel isolated and lonely and scared, those who may be struggling with addiction or despair and depression or anxiety. We ask for your spirit to be powerfully present in people who may be experiencing any of these things or any sort of illness of mind, body, or spirit, including those with chronic pain, and also those who may be mourning the loss of a loved one. God, in your mercy, we pray today also for, for Joe M. and his wife, Susan, 
as Joe is dealing with stage four cancer and in hospice care. We pray for Alan C. and his family, uh, for all of the challenges that they face together. For Sue C.'s friend, Brian L., battling ALS. For Cheryl N. and Lee S. For Walt J. and Kathleen G. For Reverend David H. and his wife, Anne. For Barbara M.'s grandniece, Nicole R. and friend, Gary R. For Bob M. and Mike S. For Patty B. and Betty A. C. For Bob H. For Ha T. For Don L. and Scott B. We also pray for the well-being of the people of Ukraine and those who have been become refugees particularly for the family that we have come to know, Vitalia, Sasha, Evelina, and Adelina B. God, in your mercy. God, we also want to make a bold prayer this morning that you would guide our search for a new music director and that you would inspire and lead the right person to come to us that we might find each other and together discover new opportunities for singing and music making that glorify you and inspire us. God, in your mercy. And now we open it up to those here in the congregation, in the sanctuary, uh, to share any prayer requests, joys, or concerns you may have. And now we open it up to those of you who are joining us on Zoom uh, to please unmute yourselves. And uh, if you have a prayer uh, request, uh, joy or concern you'd like to share. Holy and loving God, it is such a gift that we can turn to you that when we don't even have the words to express our concerns, our struggles, our gratitude, our joy, you know what is on our minds and in our hearts. And your power working within us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. We thank you for this truth, this core to our faith. And we ask once again that you help us to be newly inspired and encouraged by those wonderful words Jesus taught us to pray together. Our Father, our Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, you may recall the guidance given to Timothy those who in the present age are rich command them to depend and to set their hopes on god who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment to be rich in good works generous and ready to share i would say just about all of us living in this country and having a safe home to return to, clothing to wear, food to eat. We are all rich in that regard, and we all have something to share that is so valuable. We all have knowledge and skills, time, energy, creativity, and yes, treasure. And with it, we can make a profound difference we can support the ministries of this church. 
We can help neighbors who are struggling and may be in need. We can do amazing things when we pool our resources together. And so we have that opportunity every Sunday to practice gratitude for all that God has given us and in turn respond with great generosity. If you happen to be joining us online, you can uh, send a contribution into the church office at 269 Mill Street, Poughkeepsie, New York, 12601. Or you can go to our website, opentogod.org, and scroll down until you find the Donate Online button, which will take you to a secure website where you can make a donation by credit or debit card. And of course, if you happen to be joining us here in the sanctuary, we have an offering box in the front and also one in the back. And we invite you to uh, place your offering in one of those two places. With gratitude for all the ways that God continues to bless us, let us in turn respond with generosity. Let us join now in our unison prayer of dedication. We pray, loving God, because you have richly provided for our needs and enjoyment. Thank you. We share because this is the way for us to experience freedom, contentment, and joy. We dedicate our offerings and our lives to your service and your glory. Through them and us, may your desire for justice, healing, and beloved community be manifest in our world so that all of creation can take hold of the life that really is life. We pray in the name of the one who shows us the way to thriving aliveness. Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, we have a variety of announcements of ways we can put our faith into action. First, this is very exciting. So community family development, they are the daycare that operates in our uh, church buildings. 
they are having a 50th anniversary celebration. It's a carnival that will be taking place in our parking lot. Most of the things like the food trucks and the bounce house and all that will be in the back parking lot, so there's still room for parking in the actual parking lot. But it's happening this Tuesday from 4 to 7 p.m. And we are going to have a uh, church table set up so that in this fabulous event where all of these families and the wider community are actually coming, we might also interact and share a little bit about our congregation and, and what we're about and, and what we offer. And so if you are able to perhaps come and staff our table for any uh, length of time in that 4 to 7 p.m. time frame, please let me know um, or just show up, I mean, one way or another. We're, we ordered some more of those uh, God Loves You rainbow magnets um, to pass out, uh, and we'll have some other things, possibly a bookmark or something like that, with additional information about our church. But we really hope that you'll also be here to celebrate with CFD. It's a major milestone that they are experiencing their 50th anniversary this Tuesday from 4 to 7. Okay. Sharing Saturday is going to be just around the corner. Uh, we didn't realize it was going to be October 1st because uh, we hadn't heard that um, from our coordinators until this week, but here's the thing. Our last Sharing Saturday was at a major community-wide event at Mansion Square Park, and we gave out everything, which is wonderful, but now we need to resupply. Uh, so we need pretty much anything you might want to donate is something that we would need, whether it's shelf-stable food items, toiletries, uh, if you happen to have gently used clothes uh, that are suitable for perhaps colder times, uh, that would be great. Um, you name it, if you've got it and you can contribute it, it will make a difference and it will help our neighbors in the downtown Poughkeepsie community. So drop off, oops, sorry, go back. Um, can you go back? Yeah. Drop off for that will be this Thursday. Also from one to three, uh, somebody remind me, is that the 29th, maybe? Yes, okay, Thursday the 29th. And as you heard me praying about, we are looking for a new music director. It turns out if you know of anyone, direct them to our website, opentogod.org, so they can read a job description and they can contact us. We might need to get very creative and think outside the box, so please be willing to do that. Next slide. Our youth group experience, our very own uh, Sunday school uh, director, uh, Tracy, is uh, going to be offering a youth group experience Thursday, October 6th. And it's an opportunity for the kids to just kind of get together and hang out and, and reconnect after the summer and, and all the activities that they may have been involved in, and to do it without having a cell phone interrupting them and just to be able to uh, form fellowship and connection with one another. So keep that in mind if you know of a young person who would value that. Next slide. Whoa, this is really important, everybody. You need to save this date. We're going to be having a significant fundraiser here, a silent auction, and yes, a pie sale. I managed to reach out and talk with the Dreavers via text message, quite an extensive text message yesterday as they were in the car driving somewhere. And they are going to host a pie-making party at their wonderfully very well-equipped kitchen at their house. And uh, so we can make apple pies and we can make pumpkin pies and have them to, for sale, just as a flat rate. This is not for, for bidding on. In addition to the silent auction, because we want to find a way to bring in the wider community and not just our congregation. So more details will be coming about that. But in the meantime, if you could please be in touch with either Kathy B or uh, Linda G or Reverend Kara H. If you have items to donate, they are the people that are uh, um, finding items uh, for this. So next slide. Okay, this is another opportunity to think out outside the box. So we only have two tech gurus, which means we can only be online twice a month at the moment. But we have a feeling that there are people that come to, to worship or are joining us online who might know somebody. Maybe you've got a relative of a neighbor or a neighbor or who knows what, um, who may not be connected with our church, but might be willing to come in and run the equipment for us if we were to offer a modest stipend. And so the question is, might there be people who might be willing to sponsor a Sunday? We were thinking at the church council, you know, maybe a, a $25 
stipend. It's not a whole lot of money, but it's, it could make it worth somebody's time to come. So think about that. Next slide. Please make sure you have this marked on your calendars, our conversational conversation, uh, congregational conversation with Reverend Chernell and me, Stilly. It's coming up on Sunday, October 9th from 1 to 2.30 on Zoom. Lots more information in your bulletin and e-news about that. Next slide. Next time the anti-racist working group will be meeting is on Wednesday, October 5th. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, the anti-racism for reals book, page 82 in that book, which is one other scenario we're going to talk about, and then chapter five. So please be prepared for that. It's on Zoom as always. And there's lots of other stuff in your announcements in the e-news. Please, please, please um, read that. And if you have any questions, you can always contact me or the church office. All right, any other announcements? Oh, yes, Linda in the back. Okay, uh, Linda R., our amazing financial secretary, um, is letting everybody know that if you happen to pledge or contribute to the church, she has statements for the first eight months of the year available. Don't leave the church without yours. <laughs> okay, and then here's our upcoming calendar. We have a deacons committee meeting today on Zoom at 1.15. Uh, you already heard me talking about the 50th anniversary carnival um, and sharing Saturday coming up. Very good. All right. Well, I say we should join now in our uh, closing hymn, which is, um, O God in Whom All Life Begins. If you want to follow along in the hymnal, it's number 401. Otherwise, you can follow along with the words on the screen. <laughs> Beloved people of God, I hope this week when you feel like you're being tossed and turned by the changes and challenges of the circumstances you find yourself in, that you return to your core, to the love of God, to the presence of God who is with you and helps you to navigate that storm, and to the sense that you 
are given exactly what you need to meet the challenges that you face. You are not alone. What's more, you have the capacity to be instruments of blessing in the wider world. Truly, that is a gift that the world really needs. And the blessing of the earth maker, the pain bearer, and the life giver go with you, enriching you fully today and always. Amen.